thank you very, very much for coming and for what it means that many of you are here from quite far away. Uh, my name is David Swanson. Um, I run a website and a coalition called AfterDowningStreet.org. Uh, and I work for Democrats.com, which is not the Democratic Party, but an activist group and various other organizations. And I am a supporter of the candidacy of Cindy Sheehan for Congress. And so I'll give you my two cents on why I'm here and then introduce uh, three additional speakers, uh, and then all four of us will take uh, any questions that you might have. Um, the hearing tomorrow is called Executive Power and Constitutional Limitations on Executive Power. The Constitution is quite a short document. It discusses impeachment in six places. It devotes not a single syllable to censure, to passing legislation during the next administration to redundantly recriminalize the crimes of an elected despot, to prosecution as an alternative to impeachment, or to any of the other supposed remedies that we are going to hear about tomorrow alongside impeachment. Prosecution is referred to only as something that can occur separate from impeachment, and it should in this case. It should occur in this country and internationally, but there is the danger of a pardon and even of an absurdly unconstitutional self-pardon. And we will hear from even people like John Dean tomorrow that that can be done. It's perfectly acceptable, although outrageous. It can be done. It cannot be done. And it won't be done if Congress goes on the offensive and moves impeachment. Congress has played defense and nothing but defense and has unilaterally disarmed. Can't get requests answered, can't get subpoenas enforced, can't get contempt citations enforced, can't do anything but continue as a debate society, as a, as a gathering of royal court jesters, because impeachment is off the table. If impeachment goes on the table, if we have a real impeachment hearing, executive privilege no longer applies. That excuse is out the window. The president can respond to a subpoena or he can be impeached for failing to, as Richard Nixon was about to be when he got on a helicopter. This is a president who blatantly rewrites laws with signing statements. And according to Government Accountability Office studies, actually goes ahead and violates a huge percentage of those laws he has decreed he has the right to violate. So it's not, a, it's not just a press release, as the White House will tell you. It's an announcement of the intent to violate the law. The head of our Justice Department is not doing what you're here doing today, as he should be. The head of our Justice Department is advising that we should decree eternal, omnipresent war so that any laws that don't apply during wartime never apply anywhere ever. This is the extent of the absolutely insane and outrageous situation we find ourselves in. And we are appealing to our representatives tomorrow in the House of Representatives to uphold their oaths of office, to do the only thing that can be done. And our question, and we would, we would love for someone in the United States media, in our communication system, to ask this question of the Speaker of the House, of the Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. If we have not seen impeachable offenses here, please can you name one thing that would be an impeachable offense? And which does more harm? A single consensual affair or bombing a city on the basis of lies. Please tell us. I want to... I, I want to bring up here uh, someone who spent 27 years in the Central Intelligence Agency who knows how intelligence works in this town and doesn't, who used to deliver presidential daily briefs, who understands better than anyone else, not just that we went in to a country looking for weapons of mass destruction that turned out not to be there, but that we went in because we knew they weren't there, and the president knowingly lied us into a war that's cost over a million lives. 
Uh, he's been a leader of the peace movement and of veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, VIPS. Please welcome Ray McGovern. Those of you who have some gray hair out there, and I see there are several, will remember the, the famous question, what did he know and when did he know it? <clears throat> the answer is out there. It's just not picked up by the major media. The president knew for sure that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq on the 18th of September, 2002 six months and one day before he launched what Nuremberg called a war of aggression. How do I know that? I know that because George Tenet briefed the president on the 18th of September on the basis of the premier quintessential spy. Now, my former colleagues in the CIA were rather down, were down in the mouth uh, to admit before the war that they had no real human sources in Iraq. Now, to their great credit, they worked their butts off to get one, and guess what? They recruited one, and you all know who he was, right? Yeah. Who was he? No. Kerr. It was the Iraqi foreign minister, guys. They, they looked, no, his name was Naji Sabri. They looked in their la little bag of tricks, pulled out every one in the book and then some, spread all kinds of money around, called in all kinds of chips from liaison services, and turned, technical term, all right, turned the Iraqi foreign minister, whom Saddam Hussein thought was still working for him, but was really working for us. This happened in the spring of 2002. All the information Najee Sabri provided to us checked out. He was thoroughly evaluated, as you could imagine he would be. George Tenet, proud as could be of this major accomplishment, a major spy inside, went down to the White House and told the president, Najee Sabri, he wasted the first five minutes bragging about how they recruited him, and then said, oh, by the way, Mr. President, Naji Sabri said there aren't any weapons of mass destruction. Now, I don't know what he expected in terms of reaction from the president, but my colleagues were shocked. The president said, well, that's, that's very well. Uh, you may go now. Later they were told, we don't want to hear any more from this source because it's not about weapons of mass destruction, it's about regime change, okay? Colin Powell was not told about this. No one else was told about this. George Tenet buried it, and to this day, it's buried in the press. But guess what, folks? If you watch 60 Minutes in April two years ago, it was there, and then suppressed in the press. If you read <coughs> Salon.com in September, of 2002, an article by uh, Sidney Blumenthal, it's chapter and verse. Two former CIA officials talking about things they knew about because they were right in the thick of this. So the bottom line for me is we know what the president knew. He knew there were no weapons of mass destruction as of at the latest, September 18, 2002, six months before the war. So we knew what he knew, we know what he knew, and we know when he knew it. And if it is not an impeachable offense to distort intelligence, to ignore intelligence, to tell the chief of your intelligence agency, we don't want to hear any more of this, and then to instruct him to falsify that report, because that's what happened to that report, it was altered to indicate that Najee Sabri said there were weapons of mass destruction. That's all provable. You can get Naji Sabri. He lives in Qatar now. Get him back. Get him to testify. Get George Tenet to testify. I don't know what's wrong with our Congress, where they don't pursue these things. Now, 60 Minutes is on sort of late, so maybe John Conyers didn't catch it. Uh, and, and that was before uh, Cindy and I met with, and Reverend Ewart met with John Conyers. But uh, the Salon article was after that, and actually it's cited 
in uh, Dennis Kucinich's uh, article of impeachment now. So there's no excuse for avoiding this. Uh, major media, please pay some attention to alternative media. If you can call 60 Minutes or Salon.com uh, alternative media, because if you don't get it, you don't get it. Thanks. Thank you, Ray McGovern. Uh, I want to invite Crystal Kim from impeachbush.org uh, to read a statement. Crystal. Good afternoon. More than one million people have gone to impeachbush.org to register their support for the impeachment of George W. Bush. Ramsey, beca Ramsey Clark began this effort on January 18, 2003, when he declared the impeachment before 500,000 people in Washington, D.C., who were demanding no war against Iraq. Since that time, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis have died, and tens of thousands of U.S. soldiers have died or have suffered life-changing life injuries. This was an unprovoked war of aggression. Iraq did not pose a threat against the United States, nor could, have, nor could it have provoked a threat against the United States. The President lied to Congress, and it lied to the people regarding the need for war against Iraq. There's no question today that the President has lied to Congress and the people about the most important issue facing elected officials, and that is the issue of war and peace. For this alone, Congress must act to impeach the President. This is not a partisan political issue. Our elected officials are bound by the law. They cannot commit high crimes and misdemeanors without being held accountable. We salute Cindy Sheehan, who has made it clear that neither Nancy Pelosi nor any other leader in Congress can, quote, take impeachment off the table. To take impeachment off the table is to take the Constitution off the table, and no elected official has the right to that prerogative. Finally, we will be there tomorrow, and the whole country will be watching to see if the House Judiciary Committee does what it must do, and that is to begin the impeachment proceedings against George W. Bush. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal Kim. Uh, the rule of law is not actually only supported by radical leftists. Um, there are people across the political spectrum uh, in this country, even today, who actually think that everyone ought to be held to the rule of law and not just the endless rules of congressional hearings. Um, and our next speaker worked in the Justice Department under President Ronald Reagan and has been an outstanding, incredibly eloquent and powerful promoter of impeachment under the current uh, maladministration. Uh, please welcome Bruce Fine. There's been much said about President Bush and his deceit, the wrongdoing of this administration, this legion. But I take my inspiration from Tacitus, who I think identified a more deep pathology. As the Roman Republic degenerated into the Roman Empire, he stated, the worst crimes were dared by few, practiced by more, and tolerated by all. And I have a book that will be published next month called Constitutional Peril. And it discusses not what Bush and Cheney have done, for what Congress and the American people have let them get away with. Because we are not confronting a president and a vice president who have hidden their constitutional monstrosities. It is open and above board. Absolutely. You need no archaeological expeditions to discover <laughs> the impeachable offenses. They are on the front pages every single day. Yeah. I'll, uh, if I will, if you'll indulge me, uh, a personal note here to highlight what I think has been the decay in our political culture that has accepted with equanimity a virtual executive despotism. This is the testimony that I drafted for tomorrow's hearing, where I will be present and testify. Now, after I had completed it, 
in which it had numerous references explicitly to President Bush and Vice President Cheney. Many adjectives, uh, none of them flattering. I received a message. Uh, there are Jefferson's Manual of Parliamentary Rules that prescribe certain elocutions that are permitted in making reference to the President of the United States and the Vice President. For example, nothing that would insinuate any mendacity. My gosh, the President of I? <laughs> that would be noblesse oblige. <laughs> nothing that would suggest anything that's criminal. Or you can't say a president lied. Now then I went and did some research to find the origins of rules that seem to stem back to Magna Carta 1215 King John. Or if not that, in more modern times, perhaps something under Stalin or Mach. You can't <laughs> suggest that the leader has any flaws. And it's derived from a rule in the British Parliament that prohibited a member from speaking irreverently or seditiously against the king. So that's where these rules are derived from. We now have a king who occupies 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Say, and thereby hangs a tale about how the American people have accepted the most outlandish claims ever submitted by a president of the United States. On October 20th, 1973, I still remember that vividly. I was an attorney in Office of Legal Counsel. It actually was an independent lawyer's counsel, unlike today, where it's a hired gun to be an echo chamber of the White House. And that was the day when President Nixon had ordered the firing of Archibald Cox. He was one of my professors at Harvard Law School, because Archibald Cox had the audacity to suggest there isn't an executive privilege to conceal Oval Office conversations about obstructing justice or paying bribes. Didn't seem like a very outlandish <laughs> proposition. After all, the president is obliged to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Article 2, Section 2, it's very clear, unambiguous, original intent. And remember the origins of that. It was because under the Stuart monarchs, they had a habit of refusing to enforce laws, especially against Catholics that were recusant. And so in the 1688 English Bill of Rights, it provided that no king could desist from enforcing the law without the consent of Parliament. So this was a provision whose intent and purpose was quite clear. And that's why it was thought by Archibald Cox, who as a former Solicitor General, one who argues the case for the Supreme Court, that perhaps the President didn't have a privilege to conceal evidence of crime, even if it was in the Oval Office. Indeed, that compounded the offense. And President Nixon had then had ordered Elliot Richardson, then Attorney General, to fire Cox, which he refused to do and quit. And then uh, William Reckleshouse was the deputy, who then was the acting Attorney General. He also quit. And I remember at that time seeing Robert Pierpoint of CBS News. He was breathless on the White House lawn and said something like, you know, this is the burning of the rights talk. And he said, this is the time to stand up. This is the time to remember the Declaration of Independence. There are no vassals in this country. There are no serfs. We have unalienable rights. That means that the president can't curtail them. They're unalienable. And the whole purpose of government, the Declaration says, is to secure those rights, not to make presidents powerful, not to traipse around the Milky Way, looking at anyone saying, you're al-Qaeda, kill them. That's not the purpose of the government of the United States of America. Now, one of the things that happened at that particular moment was the American people understood that as well. It was very inspiring. At the time of the Watergate break-in, there weren't, to quote Nancy Pelosi, all the votes. You had to have an actual investigation. And here it is, John Dean testifying to Oval Office conversation where he was as close as I was to you, talking to the president, and he didn't succumb to executive privilege. No one thought. Nixon could tell Dean, shut up. You're talking about Oval Office conversations. You can't say anything. Now, what happens today when President Bush tells Karl Rove you can't show up at the Judiciary Committee? He doesn't show. Harriet Myers, ditto. Joshua Bolton, ditto. And what happens? Nothing. When I was in Washington in 1973, there were 450,000 telegrams, not emails, telegrams, that were in the White House and the Congress within days of the Saturday Night Massacre. There ended up two million phone calls came in at one stage of the impeachment uh, tragedy suggesting that if the president defied a court order, he would be impeached immediately. The American people were aroused. And it was, in my judgment, 
the finest constitutional hour in the entire history of the United States when Richard Nixon left. Because when he said later, as he felt earlier, to David Frost, if the president does it, it's legal, the American people said, no, the Constitution is superior to you. Now, the reason why I've undertaken this little historical excursion is to underscore how different things are today. Let me explain the theory of law and power that now prevails in the White House and has been accepted by Congress. After 9-11, the president in substance pronounced, we are in a permanent state of war, that we will not end a war if that danger rises to that level against international terrorism until the risk of another incident is reduced to zero. That is, he claims power to roam the entire world, including every square inch of the United States. He says, I think you're Al-Qaeda. I can use military force to kill you. Drop bombs. And if they're blended in with civilians and civilians die, you're collateral damage. That's what we see in Afghanistan. That's what we see in Iraq. That's collateral damage. That is the theory of executive power that prevails at this moment. The president says we are in an active battlefield because Osama wants to kill us here. If the president thinks anyone here is associated with Al-Qaeda, he can use military force. It's true that at present he's used this rather draconian authority abroad, Yemen, shooting missiles there, or in Macedonia, kidnap people, put them in prison in secret. In Italy, kidnapping someone, sending him to Egypt for torture. But his theory doesn't stop there. His theory is that he can do it to us. Now, what's the difference? Right now, the victims have names that are difficult to pronounce. Hamdan, Hamdi, it all sounds foreign, not going to be me. Same thing happened in World War II with a Japanese-American. Who could pronounce Korematsu, Hirabayashi, the 120,000 put in concentration camps? One of our ugliest hours. And that is what we're witnessing again today. The <laughs> president's authority is more powerful than even the king in Great Britain under George III. At least he had to have appropriations. This president says Congress can't limit my authority even through appropriations to conduct war in any way I think is necessary to win. If I have to torture to win, then you can't limit my ability to torture. If I have to violate the laws against electronic surveillance without warrants, I can do that. I can open mail. I can commit burglary. I can kidnap people. I can interrogate them in secret prisons. Anything that I think is necessary to win, I can do. Congress cannot limit it. If I need to go into Iran and attack in order to win in Iraq, I can. Now, it would be very reassuring if all of this was hyperbole and an exaggeration, but it is not. And when I've confronted these proponents of the unitary executive, which is really a synonym for an emperor, where are the limits? Well, it hasn't happened yet is all. It hasn't happened yet, but it may if there's another 9-11 or otherwise. What executive has ever voluntarily surrendered power? None. It isn't just a Bush-Cheney problem. It is an effeteness in the Congress, in the American people, that let them get away with it. And there was a very telling column written several weeks ago by Suzanne Fields concerning um, some dismay that a very tiny fraction of the American people know where Iraq is. And one of her liberal friends said, well, I don't care whether my car repairman knows where Iraq is as long as he knows how to repair my car. I don't care whether citizens are ignorant as long as they can, te can um, satisfy my demands for their services. And this is a basic, fundamental misunderstanding of what the United States of America is in democracy. We are all sentinels for everyone else. If someone isn't out looking and checking that government official, we are less safe. Because that's what democracy means. It's majority vote. It's persuasion. We have to care whether that car repairman knows where Iraq is. Because his vote determines whether or not the Congress or the President decides to undertake these reckless actions. So we all have to stand together. And it is morally culpable not to participate like Cindy is and rally to the cause. The United States would still be a British colony if that was the attitude towards the British stamp tax. And if you want to draw parallels with regard to how our colonists related to claims of omnipotence to today, after the stamp tax was repealed, when the Americans protested no taxation without representation, 
The Parliament passed the Declaratory Act the following year that said, well, we repealed the tax, but we retain authority to legislate on any matter whatsoever to govern you without your representation. And that was the spot <laughs> that led to the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson said, we cannot accept this sort of Damocles forever over our heads because then you're sitting like a coward, you know, like a very, very cowed child. You don't want to do anything because here the power is available to destroy and take retaliation against you. I could go on endlessly to describe even more terrifying theories of power asserted by this president, but I don't need to. I will simply end by summoning Bush against himself. He celebrates original intent, original meaning of the Constitution when he says he's appointing justices of the Supreme Court. If there is one thing that is absolutely clear from the Founding Fathers as they defined an impeachable offense as lying to the Senate, the Congress, the American people in order to induce them to indulge action that they would not have accepted if they knew the truth. Not only was that, that was a statement made by James Iredell. He was appointed to the Supreme Court by George Washington. He was speaking to the North Carolina Ratification Convention. So he, and of course, George Washington was the presiding officer at the Constitutional Convention. So here we have as clear a statement as possible of what is an impeachable offense that Bush has surpassed in countless occasions since his inaugural. Not only do you have that clear intent, but one of the articles of impeachment voted by the Judiciary Committee against Richard Nixon was he lied about a bogus report prepared by John Dean that purported to exonerate the White House from any complicity in Watergate. That lie, that public lie, was evidence of an impeachable offense. And here we stand today, where it's anybody who just reads the recent memoirs, Scott McClellan, George Tennant, anybody, and Ray adds sort of the, sort of the last you know, mountain of evidence on top of the obvious that the president deceived the American people about issues of war and peace, and nothing happens. Nothing happens. Now, why is it that Nancy Pelosi has been so reticent and cowardly? I think it's clear. She was alerted early on, like the Democratic leadership in the Senate, to the waterboarding, the torture, the illegal surveillance, and did nothing. In fact, her public statement that she made to the Washington Post was, well, I was told, but I couldn't tell anybody else. I mean, they didn't want me to. I said, you have an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. You can't accept office unless you make, take that oath. So if you see something that's an impeachable offense, you have to disclose it. She doesn't get it because she's not at that level. I wouldn't call it erudition. It's pretty plain and simple <laughs> to understand what your duty is. And yet, what is her preoccupation? Staying in office, having a hairdo, making it clear that the Democrats may occupy the White House. It doesn't matter if the country goes to hell in a handbasket as long as the Democrats are steering the Titanic when it sinks. Great. <laughs> yeah. A great success. Yeah. I'll just close by saying it doesn't matter how bleak, nevertheless, you know, the current political dynamics are for impeachment. We still have the privilege in the United States, unlike in many other places that I've been, 40, 50 countries confronting even more vicious government, <clears throat> to speak out, and whether we succeed or not, we know that this is our finest hour. We know that we will not yield. We know that we will not compromise. We know this is right, not because it's a Democrat or Republican issue. We know it's right because it returns the United States of America to how the Founding Fathers wanted it to be, different from other countries. Thank you. We have two more speakers, and we will do the question and answer routine. And uh, there are a lot of groups over the past many years that have worked for impeachment, and there are some that have grown and gotten more organized and more aggressive and really pushed this through to what may be getting close to the finish line. Uh, and one of those is really the organization of the National Impeachment Network, 
uh, and one of the leaders who has pushed this through and made it happen and taken impeachment and shoved it in the face of a Congress that doesn't want to hear about our Constitution is Cynthia Papermaster. Please uh, come up to the podium. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to thank Cindy Sheehan for her moxie, <laughs> for her bravery, for her patriotism. Thank you, Cindy. And uh, we're behind you all the way in November. Uh, the National Impeachment Network represents about 250 impeachment groups across the country talking together, strategizing, and taking action to move impeachment forward. We represent over 150,000 impeachment activists, and these are not people who simply sign petitions. These are people who are ready to take action. They phone, they email, they visit Congress, and that's what we have been doing this last month, lobbying Congress members to ask them to take the next step and make this impeachment happen. We have three asks of the Judiciary Committee meeting tomorrow, the hearing, and these are simple, easy actions for them to take that they must take. There's no question in our minds they must do these things, one or more of these things. The immediate impeachment and removal of Vice President Richard B. Cheney from office, that is the most urgent ask that we have. We want them to take a vote on doing that tomorrow. We want him impeached and removed from office. Number two, we want them to immediately schedule a follow-on impeachment hearing before the August recess. And number three, we want them to send one or more articles of impeachment to the floor of the House for a vote before the August recess. Those are the three things we're asking them to do. They are all easily accomplished. That is the responsibility and the uh, constitutional duty of this committee and all representatives in the House. And, uh, we're going to wait and see what they do. We have these thousands, hundreds of thousands of activists waiting at home to see what's going to happen. We imagine there'll be tremendous media coverage tomorrow, and we thank the media for doing this. Um, and we are behind those Judiciary Committee members all the way. They will suffer absolutely no political blowback. This is a slam dunk for them. We're behind them all the way, and the country is watching and hoping the majority of American citizens are hoping that they will take action tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia Papermaster, who is here from California, along with people from all over the country lobbying our government, as we all should be doing, everyone who can, who can manage it. Um, a, a, along with censure and redundantly recriminalizing crimes and the other things that don't come up in the Constitution are political parties. And many of the people who wrote that document had quite a fear of what they called factions getting too much power. Last week, Nancy Pelosi explained that she doesn't back impeachment because she wants to be bipartisan. So here we have a, du a double whammy, I mean, two parties controlling the thinking of this woman who is supposed to be leading the representation of the people of the United States of America. We have someone with us here who's not speaking on behalf of and not taking any orders from any party at all. Someone who lost her son, her beautiful son, in a, a war that was based on blatant lies. Someone who a year ago declared that she would run in opposition to Nancy Pelosi for her seat in California's 8th District because she was not putting impeachment back in our Constitution and who led, along with Ray McGovern and Reverend Lennox Yearwood and others, a sit-in in John Conyers' office and sat with the congressman and spoke with him at length in very gentle and understanding terms and got absolutely nowhere and went to jail. Someone who I think will have absolutely no problem tomorrow if permitted to speak with the restriction on naming the president because I have never heard her call him anything other than the lying bastard. <laughs> Please give every dollar you have. If you haven't gone and given ten dollars, there's a problem. Give everything you can spare to Cindy Sheehan for Congress. Here's Cindy.
Thank you. It's so great to see everybody here on such a short notice. Uh, we, Cindy for Congress, hadn't planned on um, being here in Washington, D.C. because we're deep into our signature gathering right now, and it's been consuming us to get on the ballot. But in the past couple of weeks, uh, it has just like mushroomed or exploded, and we're down to under 1,400 sign signatures now. So we will be only the sixth uh, nonpartisan declined to state candidate in California to attain ballot status. So anyway, we were. Thank you. We are doing so well, and we um, just hired someone else who had been working with Dennis Kucinich. So he stayed in San Francisco and allowed us to be here where I think we really need to be um, today and tomorrow. Wow. First of all, I'd like to thank Ray McGovern, who <laughs> he and I have done so much together, and David, of course, and we all met and started working around the Downing Street memo. And Bruce Fine um, just gives so much credibility to our movement credibility, intelligence, knowledge, uh, experience to the impeachment movement. And I was just blown away when I saw him on um, the Bill Moyer show with John Nichols, another, you know, left-wing progressive that I have worked so hard um, on in, with the impeachment impeachment issue with, and I thought Bruce was way stronger <laughs> than John was. So anyway... Um, it's just really great to be here with uh, good friends and, and um, new faces, and especially Veterans for Peace, who was the first organization to come out for impeachment. And I rode from um, Dallas, Texas to Crawford the very first day on the um, Veterans for Peace impeachment bus. And impeachment... I mean, it's not talked about that much, but it was n unheard of in August of 2005. And, I mean, there was a, a big controversy that I was on the impeachment bus. And I'm like, oh, well, of course I want George Bush impeached. You know, don't you? Why don't you? And um, I not only want him impeached, I want him dragged out of my White House, and I want him thrown in The Hague. For war crimes, because not only has he not only has he violated our rule of law, national law, constitutional law, he has violated international law, and he is a war clearly a war criminal. It's about time an American president paid for um, those kinds of crimes. I. Um, just flew in from California last night. There's a reason they call it a red eye. And um, I woke up this morning and read that Conyers has said that tomorrow they can't talk about lies or crimes or mention George Bush or Dick Cheney because it's not an impeachment hearing. Well, I have a solution for that. Make it an impeachment hearing. <laughs> but <clears throat> there's so many good people here that are really being betrayed by our Democratic leadership in Congress. And they came into power in 06, promising to end the war. Billions of dollars later, thousands of lives later, more destruction, more death. They have not even made one, one um, inch of progress in ending the war. We thought, since John Conyers, I like Bruce's title for his next book, Constitutional Peril, John Conyers, when he was the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee before the Democrats uh, attained majority, wrote a book called Constitution in Crisis. I was with, in Detroit with him months after he had me arrested in his office, and my, I was receiving an award from the Crown Brook Peace Institute, and my, part of my speech was reading the introduction while John Conyers was sitting right next to me. And I asked him, what happened between then and now that all of a sudden George Bush is innocent of all the crimes you accused him of? I'm afraid tomorrow's hearing is going to, be a, going to be another dog and pony show, like the Downing Street memo hearings were. 
I prepared, I, I and Ray were uh, two of the four people that testified. Uh, Joe Wilson, Ambassador Joe Wilson was another one, and constitutional attorney and um, expert John Boniface was the other one. I prepared my statement so diligently. I worked really hard. I thought this was a smoking gun. I thought this when in July of 2002, British intelligence said that they're going to war whether we like it or not, and they're going to fix the intelligence around the policy. What could be clearer than that? And now, three years later, after the Downing Street hearings, and six years later, after the memo, these people are still committing their crimes. I'm afraid that it's just a dog and pony show to pander to the people who have been working so hard for peace and accountability, the democratic base, that not only are the, the elected Congress right now, not only are they abusing and betraying us, but their presidential candidate is abusing and betraying us on peace and on accountability. So they're throwing us a bone, and they expect us to take it like good dogs with a pat on our heads from the master and swallow, once again, their bile. Well, I'm not going to swallow it. I promised my volunteers that I wouldn't get arrested. Well, I said I, I didn't plan on getting arrested the last time I got arrested. <laughs> so you never know what's going to happen. But I'm not going to sit there and let them pander to the lowest common denominator of this country. Like Bruce said, we have to rise up. And we have to say, we're not going to take it from you all anymore. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't have to tell anybody in this room, but maybe somebody who will be watching this, that the Democrats and the Republicans are in the pockets of the special interests. That's what runs our country. The corporate lobbyists. The Democrats are in the left pocket, the Republicans are in the right pocket. And that's who they really represent. And unless we elect third party candidates, independent candidates, and even if you think that Cynthia McKinney or Ralph Nader don't have a chance, you should not throw away your vote on one of the corporate candidates. You should work really hard for people like Ralph and Cynthia who have never compromise their integrity for a vote or a buck, and that they don't pander to the lowest common denominator in this country, but they call us all to come up to where they are. And that brings me to uh, my candidacy. <clears throat> like I said before, we have been, the, the money and the signatures have been pouring into the office, so we have been able to come. This week we passed a milestone of over a quarter million raised for our candidacy, and we haven't even done any fundraising yet. We've been so busy getting our office open, moving to San Francisco, uh, you know, getting into the community, getting our signatures, that we haven't even done any fundraising, and we raised over a quarter million. And for a candidate who is not in any party, it doesn't have any party strict structure, that's incredible. Um, <clears throat> there's one thing that Bruce said that I'm going to have to disagree with, though. He called Pelosi cowardly. Again, I think that's letting them off the hook. So I can't, I can't do anything because I'm afraid. No, she's not afraid. She is an accomplice in the Bush crimes. Not only like uh, Bruce and David have mentioned the torture, she knew about it in, um, in 2002. Like Bruce said, she was fully briefed on what our country was doing. And do you think a Cindy Sheehan congresswoman would be silent about violations of, of humanity like that? The first thing I would do would be to call a press conference and say, this is what your country is doing, and we can't be silent about it. We have to stop it. She, of course, is one of the Democrats in, in the left pocket of the corporate interests. 
Our donations have come from about 3,500 people at an average donation of $70. We had a blind man walk in the office yesterday and give us his economic stimulus check <clears throat> of $640. We have homeless people walking in and handing us the change out of their pockets, but then we walk out and they ask for it back. <laughs> but, you know, they know that that is a problem that <clears throat> Nancy Pelosi has not and will not address because she's too busy signing blank checks for war. She's too busy signing blank checks for militarism. She's too busy to, to see what we see on the streets of San Francisco, they should na name a little show about that. On the streets of San Francisco every day, the homeless, the hungry, the sick, the, the ignorant, she, she can't see that. She's sitting in her mansion on the hill and she is um, too busy handing George Bush everything he wants and more. <clears throat> The first time I was here was in October of 04, and I actually did a press conference here at the uh, National Press Club because my family and I had participated in something called Real Voices, and we filmed commercials um, talking about the pain that the Bush administration had caused. And we had a big picture of Casey that's now, that has traveled all over the world with me, it was at Camp Casey with me in Crawford, Texas. It has been, um, you know, packed in my suitcase, dragged along everywhere. And so now it's sitting in our office with a picture of George Bush with the dead soldiers comprised, you know, that picture. Uh, it's a montage uh, that, that um, shows the president, but also a montage of Nancy Pelosi in the same way. Since she's become Speaker of the House, over 1,200 soldiers have died. And that's not even talking about the collateral damage of the Iraqis and, and Afghans who have died since she has been um, Speaker of the House. So we do have to challenge the entire system, both pockets. When I was only um, fighting against the right pocket, George Bush and the war, I was a hero of many people on the so-called left. But now that I'm challenging the entire system, we have people in San Francisco, mind you, that say, she's too extreme. <laughs> I would never vote for her. And, and the way I'm dressed today, that's the, this is the way I dressed every day before my son was killed. You know, so I didn't, like, go to work every day in shorts and a T-shirt. That was just the... the um, uniform that was forced on me when my son was killed. They say I'm too extreme when all I'm saying is that we need to bring our troops home from Iraq and Afghanistan to solve that immediate problem, but to, but to solve the problem that caused Iraq and Afghanistan, George Bush and Dick Cheney must be impeached and removed from office. That's one step. <clears throat> and another thing we have to do is reduce military spending. Barack Obama, Barack Obama wants to increase it and add troops. That is only for empire building, not defense. Our military must be used only for defense, and we can reduce it by half, and we would still be spending more than all of the countries combined on militarism. We must use the money we save that we use killing people now and oppressing people all over the world a thousand bases as a tiny U.S. empire. We need to close those bases, use that money to pay for universal single-payer health care. Everybody in this country deserves, has the right to housing. It, to me, it is, it's 
unconscionable that we in America have people living on the streets, that millions of children go to bed hungry every night. And this is an America we're talking. We're not talking about the millions around the world. We're talking about our country. Oh my goodness, the minimum wage went up 70 cents today. And it's only going to affect the few people in the country that were still below that level. And they're going to get $28 more a week if they work full time. They can't even fill up their tank or buy a bag of groceries for that money. We need a living wage, not a minimum wage. <clears throat> we need the money that we're wasting on the military industrial, com industrial complex to go to cleaning up the environment and to have a sustainable future. We do not need to drill in Anwar offshore. What we need to do is eliminate this country's dependence on fossil fuels. And nobody is talking it. Nobody is talking about that with the leadership. You know, Nancy Pelosi said you're not going to drill off of California, but she doesn't have a plan for alternative sustainable sources of energy. So impeachment is just a remedy for the abuses and the crimes of the Bush regime. But I believe that it will also constrain the hands of a president Obama or President McCain, if they know the people of America are not going to let them get away with their crimes. And the people of America have spoken. They do want this. But our leadership is failing us, like I said before, and they're not listening to us. But we, if they're not listening to us, that means that we just have to be louder. And please, um, like David said, support my candidacy because, you know, McCain and Obama aren't going to talk about these issues. And as a matter of fact, how can they talk about the issues when they're about that far apart <laughs> on any of the issues? And, and on some of the issues, they could be the same candidate. But I guarantee you, in San Francisco's 8th district, on a national level, we will be discussing these issues. I don't care about Nancy Pelosi's hairdo or facelifts or whatever. What I care about is her lack of leadership, her policies that are colluding with the Bush regime. I don't care if she wears a, a flag lapel pin. What I care about is she is condemning our soldiers and the people of Iraq to die with her blank checks for war. So let's um, help America understand what we need to understand. And we know our elected officials won't be the leaders, so we have to be the leaders. And I know we all have been working really hard at this. Tomorrow is a baby step, but it, at least it's a step in the right direction. And um, if we have to push them and shove them in the right direction, that's what we have to do. So anyway, again, thank you for being here on such short notice. And we'll take questions now. And we'll see you all, I guess, tomorrow at the hearing.